comes from a town called Cranberry in Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. Now this is a lady who's had an extraordinary life and when I think about Rita Klaus I think about the Trinity. She's had three definite phases in her life. Rita Klaus was a Servite nun, a Servite sister. That was her first vocation. She contracted multiple sclerosis which forced her to abandon her chosen vocation. She was a sufferer for five years before there was any sort of remission, which itself was miraculous and about which no doubt Rita will tell you. Then to the married state. Married and raised a family. As that family responsibility moved, no doubt, Rita has come to the third stage in her life. Former Servite sister, the married vocation, with a family, she is now a retreat master. Her vocation has come back to where it started from in the layer-sized form. She's extraordinarily generous with her time. I know her father is seriously ill and she won't mind me telling you that and the prognosis is not good. However, she has come out here to be with us yet again and we're so pleased. Rita Klaus is known right throughout North America. She appears regularly in television. She's been on that very favorite program, Opera Winfrey, about which I know very little. <laughs> about Mother Angelica Live, of which I know a little more. And has written and has lectured and continues to do this in an extraordinarily active ministry. And thank God she is back here in 1997, our friend Rita Klaus. Thank you for such a beautiful and warm welcome. Uh, we, we start with a very wee, beautiful little prayer, all right? Okay. Mary, my mother, queen, loving mother of the Savior, and in a special way, the mother of all of us, I ask you to be here today to hold each one of us in your loving arms, Ask your son Jesus to open our hearts that his grace may flow in and that the words I'm asked to give will find a receptive place. I ask you to use these words for the glory of the kingdom of thy son, Jesus. Be with us, love us, console us, in other words, always be our mother. Amen. Amen. How many of you were here last year? Marvelous. How many of you were not here last year? Marvelous. I remember I asked you last year to each one of you bring somebody new. How many did? Come on, be honest. How many of you brought somebody? How many of you dragged somebody? <laughs> oh good, I like that. That's terrific. Always bring them kicking and screaming to the Lord. That's good. That's kind of the way the Lord does with us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we come kicking and screaming. I was one of those. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, a lot of you heard my story last year, right? You don't want to hear it again. Oh. All right, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the witness now. But tomorrow is the meat and potatoes, all right? The meat and potatoes of prayer. And I've had so many requests. I give a lot of retreats. And, um, of course, I, you know, I can, I, they give me lots of hours to talk, like you get to talk for seven hours. You get to do seven one-hour conferences, you know, all that kind of thing. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk a real long time. No, they gave me 40 minutes. So I'm going to condense the retreat into 40 minutes. 
No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you very basic, very practical, very usable ways to pray in your very, very busy lives. All right? It'll be the most practical thing, I hope, and the most usable thing, I hope, that you've heard in a long time. Some of you may not want to stay for it because you may be, you know, in the ninth castle of the soul, and it won't be practical for you. But the rest of us, I, I hope, will stay and listen and enjoy. All right? <clears throat> As I said in the beginning that I was kind of dragged kicking and screaming to the Lord, and, and that's the truth. Um, when I was a young, I'd say a young mother, I was an old mother really, I didn't have my first baby till I was 35, but in 1985, 86, some very different things began to happen in my life. Uh, I began to really know the Lord in a very special way. And to me, it was a time of great blessing because for the years preceding this time, I had had an extremely difficult time with the Lord. And I'm sure he had a very difficult time with me. As, um, as Philip told you, I had been a Servite nun. And then because of the MS, I left my community, which in itself was a horrendous uh, and devastating decision. I made it with counsel and, and with um, a great prayer, but I still was never sure that I had made the right decision. And it left me with a great deal of guilt and a great deal of, I'd say, anxiety. And this pre kind of stayed with me through the years. And, you know, when you live with that kind of anxiety and, and that lack of peace, it disrupts your life, your prayer life, your family life. It makes you not as warm and not a very inviting person. In 1981, five years before uh, I was healed, I was invited to go to a healing mass. Now, at the time I was invited to go to the healing mass, I had had MS for 20 odd years. And I was uh, in a uh, very bad state, not just physically, but mentally and especially spiritually. The doctors had told me I had what was called acute progressive spinal MS. It was devastating for me. I think it was even more devastating for my husband and extremely devastating for our three little children who were at, the, at that time ages three five and seven or six around there but anyway I was invited to go to this healing mass by a friend of mine and at this point in my life I had quit praying I was so angry at the Lord and people would say to me how can you be angry you were a nun hey I was a nun I wasn't a saint I thought I was at points in my life. Oh, God, you're so lucky to have me, you know. <laughs> I entered the convent when I was 15. How lucky can you get? But believe me, my faults were big and glaring. My prayer life was almost non-existent. I tried bargaining with the Lord, you know. We all do that when we're faced with trouble. Dear Lord, I'll do this if you do that. I think you call it twisting the, the Lord's arm, but the thing is it doesn't work that way. And we find that out a little bit too late, some of us. But I remember telling the Lord, if you just leave the MS in the lower part of my body and leave the upper part, you know, that'll be acceptable. And then it went into my hands, it went into my face, I got Bill's palsy, half my face was paralyzed. I gave up on that prayer, it didn't work. I didn't want to go to Mass anymore because it was like heaven's door was shut. And so when Mary Ann called and asked me to go to a healing Mass, I was not kind to her at all. The first time she called, I said, no. 
I don't want to go. The second time she called, she began to reason with me. And I was not a reasonable person. And she said, Rita, it'll be great. They lay hands on people and they're healed. I said, Marianne, I'm a scientist. There is no such thing as healing except from doctors and they can't do a darn thing. She called a third time and by this time I was aggravated. My patience was very, very, very thin to say the least. And she said, Rita, you don't have to get prayed over. I said, good, I'm not going to be prayed over. And she said, but you should see the healings that happen. I've seen them. And you've seen them on TV. And that's all she had to say. My brother was an investigative reporter for a while for one of the major networks. And he had uncovered one of the healing scams up in Michigan. He told me about the plants they had in the audience. He told me about the money that crossed hands during these so-called healing sessions. And I said to her, you know, Marianne, that's right, they have healings, uh-huh. She says, yeah. I said, yeah, I see it on TV. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, you in the orange dress or the green dress or the brown suit, come up and be healed. They all speak with that same voice. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they come up. And she says, uh-huh. And they lay hands on them, uh-huh. That's right. And then she said, then they fall down, slain in the spirit. I said, Mary Ann, they fall down because they got pushed. <laughs> and they were too embarrassed to get up. <laughs> well, anyway, I told her in no certain terms, I was not going to this healing service. Goodbye. Unknown to me, my husband heard part of the conversation. And he said to me, why aren't you going? And why are you being so mean to Mary Ann? And he said, you have so few friends left. <laughs> and I said, oh, she wants me to go to some healing mass. And he said, well, why don't you go? My good Lutheran husband wants me to go to a healing mass. He said, you know, you're really selfish. You are so selfish. He said, you never think of anyone but yourself. What about me? If you won't go for yourself, go for me. Okay? So I called Mary Ann back and said, all right, you can pick me up at 7. And in my mind, I said, but nobody is touching me. <laughs> On the way over in the car, Mary Ann explained to me that the healing, the laying on of hands, would not happen until after the Mass. And I said, good. And she said, you don't even have to come up. You can just stay back there in your pew. And when everything's finished, we'll just come pick you up and we'll go home. I said, good. I was not going up. We got to the church. The church was absolutely packed with people. They were all over the place. And I was ready to turn around because there was no way I could stand. And people were standing all around the sides. I had braces up to my hips. I had big steel crutches. And the only way I could stand is that my braces locked at the knees. I walked like Frankenstein, you know, by swinging my hips. But all of a sudden, two ushers saw me. You know, the over-solicitous kind. <laughs> and they, it was like they said, oh, there's one. Get her. And they had me by either side, you know, and I'm a big lady. I've never been small. I don't think I was small when I was born. But anyway, they, they got me on one each side, and they were helping me up the aisle when my crutches were kind of bouncing off my elbows. And they came to this pew that was already full of people. And the people looked at them like, hey, I've been sitting here two hours. This is my seat. And then they saw the crutches. Oh, dear. Oh, my. I'm well, we all moved down, because because we're Christians, we'll move down. And they put me in at the end of the pew, and they put my crutches down on the floor, and they no sooner had done that than the organ began to play, and everybody stood up. And everybody began to sing, Habab, 
the Father. And it was lovely. And meantime, I was looking all around this church. And you know, there had to be a thousand people there. And I thought, my Lord, they're going to lay hands on every one of these people. We're going to be here all night. We'll never get out of here. So I began, as the ministers and the priests began to come up the aisle, because it wasn't ecumenical, there was a mass, but it was also ecumenical. There were some other uh, ministers there from other denominations that were going to help with the blessings. And I began to count. One, two, three. I got all the way up to nine, thinking of dividing the thousand people by eight, dividing them by nine, dividing them, because I have the scientific mind, you know, that and trying to estimate how long it was going to take, like one minute for each one to get blessed, you know. Divide by, 1,000 by, this equals how many minutes? You could tell it was very, 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 very reverent. Very glad to be there. But anyway, as number nine was going through my mind and up the aisle, I heard this stage whisper from the back, wait. And as that sound echoed in my ear, I felt these two hands grab me as I saw the priest that was going by me poke the one in front of him who turned around, and then they, turned, they all started turning around. In the meantime, I was caught in a bear hug from behind. It was so sneaky. <laughs> and the only thing I could think of is they told me there was no laying on hands or praying till after the Mass, and we hadn't even got up the aisle yet. <laughs> well, in a moment, everybody was around me. It was like being smothered by arms. There wasn't a part of my anatomy that wasn't being touched by somebody. And this priest who was praying over me, I was trying to look around my shoulder to get a good look at him. His eyes were closed. His arms were crossed like this in front of me. His head was laying against the backside of my shoulder. And he was praying. And I was mad. <laughs> I was so angry because I was being made a spectacle of. But it was the most beautiful day in my life. Because as that priest prayed and the body of Christ surrounded me and prayed, an incredible thing happened. It was like all of a sudden everyone disappeared and I was in a white light. And in this white light was the most incredible peace and I had experienced something like it many years ago when I was about nine years old and I had almost drowned and had a near-death experience. And it was like being enveloped inside and out in this peace. It was like being loved and know that you're loved and having that love absolutely overwhelm you in every, every part of your body, every, every sense. And I found myself praying the first real prayer I'd said in years. And I said, dear God, I don't know what this is all about, but whatever you want, you can have. And I went home from that healing service, not healed physically, but with a healing that was a million times better than any physical healing, because that was the healing that gave me back my life. People ask me all the time, I say, oh, when you were physically healed, how did that change your relationship with the Lord? How did that change your life? And I say, no, 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 you got it wrong. You got it wrong, wrong, wrong. The day I was spiritually healed, that was the day that changed my life. And I will never talk about the physical healing without talking about the spiritual healing first. And that spiritual healing is available to all of us no matter what. And that spiritual healing lets you know that God lives in you, and he loves you, and he not only loves you, but he is in love with you. And that he holds us. And many times, yes, he lets things happen in our lives, but he lets them happen for a reason. And we have a free will to say yes or no. Either we can accept it from the Lord. It doesn't mean we have to like it. We can kick and scream. We can complain. Hey, the Lord's got big shoulders. But in the end, as long as we say yes. It doesn't matter if we good our teeth while we say it either. 
He understands. But you say yes. And if you say yes, then because of the trials, because of the sorrows, because of the afflictions that are allowed in your life, you and I become better people. We become holy people. We become joyful people in the Lord. I have met so many people in my life, and so have you, that are like I was, angry, and that anger comes out in everything they do, in every relationship. They just can't seem to get a grip on joy. They can't seem to find love. And because they haven't found love and they don't know love, they can't give something they don't have to anybody else. And once you know it, and once you have it, you never want to lose it. And it doesn't matter what happens to your body. It doesn't matter if you lose your bank account. Because with the Lord, we can do all things. And somehow, if we let the Lord into our lives, and we let him move and work in our lives, all things are given to us that we need and more blessings are heaped on top besides. It sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? To let go, to let the Lord in your life, to lose it all, only to gain it all, and to gain more besides, but it's the truth. It is the truth. The next five years of my life, do you think I got better? Hmm, I got really bad. The MS spread very rapidly. But my mental attitude matched my spiritual attitude. And for some reason, because I had the Lord and I knew his peace, my life changed. And it became for me a time of mercy, a time of growth, a time of love, a time of regaining my family, my husband, and of living the life that God wants all of the body of Christ to live. On June 18th, 19, or I'm going to go back to January 1st. In January of 1986, I had a very strange dream. By this time, I was in a wheelchair full time. I had no more bladder function. I would sometimes lose it emotionally because I had so many scars in my brain. I would go to laugh and I would cry. I'd go to cry and I'd laugh at the most inappropriate times. I'd go to say words and the wrong words would come out. There were so many problems physically. My right leg had been operated on three times for contractures and because of extreme pain due to sciatica. And in the end they cut the tendons. They did what was called a radical retinacular release. It left my right leg totally deformed with my kneecap slid over looking at my left leg. They put a special cup on my brace so the kneecap wouldn't bounce against the metal brace. It was very uncomfortable. It was very awkward. But I was past that part. I was teaching in our local Catholic school for peanuts, but you know, it was all right. I had charge of the first communicants and I taught music, church music, and I loved it. I had the children's choir, I loved it. My life, the parish was very good in supplying me with everything I needed to teach from a wheelchair and the state very lovingly uh, gave me uh, several wheelchairs plus an electric one. So I was able, able to do things. They were equipping a special van for me to use. <clears throat> so even though I was handicapped, I was still able to be out and about in a certain restricted way. But in January of that year, I had a very strange dream. 
And it was only a dream, it was not a vision. Because I had people come up, oh, tell me about your vision. I never had a vision, okay? Never, 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 never. I live in faith just like you do, okay? But anyway, in this dream, I received a letter. It was a beautiful letter. It glowed, absolutely glowed. The paper was so white, and it was like satin. And in my dream, I could feel the paper. In real life, I couldn't feel anything. My fingers were numb. I had what they call quadriparesis. That's incomplete paralysis of both the arms and the legs. I had very little sensation left, very little muscle movement left. But in my dream, I could feel the paper, and it was like satin. And it was addressed to me in the most beautiful calligraphy I had ever seen. Addressed to me. And I remember I opened it so carefully because I didn't even want to wrinkle the beautiful paper on the un or the envelope. And I took the letter out and I read it. And it said, Dear Rita, if you will come to my mother's church at 12 o'clock, you will see my mother. And it was signed, Jesus. Now you would think I'd be really happy getting a letter like that. But I wasn't. The Lord and I were in really familiar terms, so when I had a gripe, I told him. And right away I started griping. Lord, you know that, first of all, I'm in a wheelchair. Okay? I, it's really hard for me to go any place. Secondly, you know that every time your mother appears someplace, it's far, far away. And thirdly, Lord, you know it costs a lot of money to go where your mother appears, and we don't have any. And Lord, the last thing I'm going to complain about is that wherever your mother appears, it's full of rocks. <laughs> I said, look at La Salette, rocks. Lourdes, rocks. Fatima, rocks. I said, every picture I see of where your mother appears, it's full of rocks. She should be called Our Lady of the Rocks. Now, you know this was a dream, because I'm really telling the Lord this whole thing. And I said, and lastly, you didn't even tell me where this church is or what the name of it is, so how am I supposed to get there? If you want me to go to this church, Lord, you take me there yourself. And the next minute, I was outside this church, and it was a very strange-looking church. Not anything like any church we have in the States. It was all white on the outside. And there was two white square towers on each side of the front door. And the next moment, as I was questioning where am I and what is this, I was inside the church and it was filled with people. Filled. You couldn't push another person in there if you tried. And it was absolutely quiet. It was so hushed. Everybody was like waiting in anticipation of something. And I wanted to know what they were doing. So my next thought was, what is this and what's going on? And I want to be up front so I can see. And the next thing I knew, I was up front. All I had to do was think about it. The front of the church had a large white arch. And the church was absolutely devoid of any ornamentation. There were no pictures except the stations on the wall. There was no paintings. There was no colors. There was no paint. Everything was white. The windows were white. The arches were white. The altar was white, 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 white. Very strange. And as I was up in the front of the church, all of a sudden, the chimes began to ring in the bell towers. And they rang 12 times as everybody waited in hushed silence. And as the last 12th chime echoed away, there came a rush of wind through the church. And in the wind came a cloud, and from the cloud came our Blessed Mother. And I'll never forget in that dream what she looked like. She was so beautiful, her skin Every little pores in her skin like sparkled like diamonds. And yet it was like almost clear, crystal clear. It was so amazing, like she was full of light. And then I woke up. And I remember I woke up and I was like, where am I? This was so real. I reached, reached over and I felt my husband sleeping next to me and I started to cry. I was back in my own bed. It was, it was a dream. It wasn't real. And I puzzled on it and I puzzled on it. What was this? A few weeks later, 
I received a gift from a parishioner, a grandfather really of one of the students that I was preparing for First Communion. And the envelope had a $20 bill in it. And he said to me, as he gave it to me, this is for a personal gift for you. You cannot buy ice cream for the children or shoes or whatever. It's for you. You must spend it on yourself. And I remember asking my husband, well, what shall I do? And he said, well, he stipulated, spend it on yourself. So you have to spend it on yourself. And there was a book by Sister Lucia Fatima that I really wanted. It was her diary that had just been published by Trinity Publications. And there was another book about Fatima by Father Pelletier. And together, the two books came to 1695. So I sent away for them. And they were wonderful books. I loved them. I loved reading them. I, I, I just did. It was marvelous, especially to hear about Fatima and Sister Lucy's own words. But a very strange thing happened. During this time, I also got a copy of Reader's Digest, and there was a story in there about a place called what I thought was Medjugorje. <laughs> it was about the Blessed Mother supposedly appearing to six young people, one of them only eight years old. And I knew it was very special, and I had said to my pastor, I would like to find out more about this Medjugorje place at some place in Yugoslavia. And he said, oh, leave that alone. You don't need that. You've got Fatima, you've got Lourdes, you don't need that stuff. Leave it alone. But I was curious, you know. Well, nobody could help me find out anything about Medjugorje. Because every time I'd ask somebody about Medjugorje, they say, Medjo what? <laughs> I didn't even know how to pronounce it, as you know. Well, the very strange thing happened was that after I got these books, Trinity Publications started sending me little credit slips saying, we owe you $9.95. You overpaid your bill. And I went back in my checkbook. No, I hadn't. I wrote them a nice letter, and I was angry at having to write them a letter because it was very difficult for me to write. I, I wrote very large. It was very scribbly and shaky because I had intention tremors so bad, and I could, couldn't feel anything with my hands. And I had to use this big, thick pen. And I'd write like two words, and I'd have to rest. And I'd write two more words, and I'd have to rest. And it was so hard to read my writing, it was so ugly, you know. So anyway, I was angry. Any time I had to write a letter, it would make me mad, you know. So I was even angrier the next month when they sent me another one. And they said, we do not carry credit for individuals, only for parishes and institutions. Therefore, either order something or we will refund your money. Well, they didn't owe me any money. But along with the, the credit slip, they had sent me a, a brochure. And as I opened it up right in the middle, staring at me, was, Is the Blessed Virgin Mary appearing at Medjugorje by Father René Laurentin, who I knew was a renowned Mariologist. And there was a picture of this church with two white square towers next to the advertisement of the book. And I recognized the church the church that was in my dream. And so I was very excited. And the book was $6 plus three ninety-five shipping and handling. <laughs> Doesn't God provide? <laughs> but anyway, that was my introduction to Medjugorje. Now, as all of you know, it's not approved by the church. It has what is called, now don't get this word messed up, please. It is not a cult. Okay? But it is an approval from Rome called cult approval. And all that means is it's not a cult. It means that people are allowed, because of the fruits of the conversions, because of the beautiful uh, changing of, people li of people's lives, and good things are coming from Medjugorje, the faithful are allowed to go. Priests, however, are not really supposed to go in any official capacity because it's not approved by the church. It's reported that the Holy Father said if he wasn't Pope, he would go. But I don't think the Holy Father would because he'd be breaking his own law. I mean, the Vatican law. So anyway, lay people may organize pilgrimages. And then the Holy Father said priests would be allowed to go in a spiritual capacity to meet the needs of the people. So we're gonna get this straight, right?
Lay people may organize, lay people may take. The priests may go to take care of the people only. They cannot organize a pilgrimage. So don't go home and ask your, your father, Father Joe, please organize a pilgrimage to Medjugorje because he'll be breaking the Vatican law. Okay? And it's not a cult, it has cult approval. Okay? We get these things all mixed up, don't we? But that's all right, sometimes. Well, anyway. I knew that Medjugorje was a very special place. A short time later, somebody sent me another book about Medjugorje, and inside was a picture of the church. And yes, it was the church in my dream. So I knew this was a very special place. I had no idea what role, however, it would play in my life. I just knew this was very strange, you know. And uh, very, very strange. So I was, it was hard to put it out of my mind. But I began to live the messages Our Lady has asked us to live. And at Medjugorje, it's not anything new. And no, I never saw Blessed Mother there. No. And no, I never saw the sun spin. I didn't look. I didn't want to burn out my eyeballs. Okay? I didn't need to see the sun. I know Jesus, the sun, is here in the Eucharist. I don't need to go out and look at the sun. I have the sun. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what more do you need? We have scripture, and this is what our Blessed Mother is saying. First of all, read the scriptures. Love the scriptures. Make the scriptures part of your life. Don't make it a coffee table book or a place you record your baptisms and your funerals and your weddings, and otherwise you don't open it. Don't just wait for the priest to read the word of God to you at Mass. Because half the time you finish it and you say, huh, what was that? You need to read it slowly and prayerfully and lovingly and meditatively if you're going to understand and have it effective in your life. So that's what Our Lady says. Our Lady asks us to pray more. I said that to one of my little children once. He went, ooh, oh, I hate it. It's so boring. We have to learn not to make prayer boring for our children, all right? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Our Lady asks us to receive the sacraments with great faith and very frequently, and to prepare well for the reception of the Eucharist, and to give an adequate and loving thanksgiving afterwards. She said a beautiful preparation is to prepare yourself all the way to the church. Now for those of you who have little children, forget it. It ain't going to work. For those of you who don't, it'll work, all right? She asks us after we receive the Eucharist, to spend some time in meditative prayer, and then she asks us to make our thanksgiving all the way home. She asks us to fast in any way we can. Now that doesn't mean you have to fast on bread and water. One of the visionaries asked her, well, what is the best fast? And she said, for those who can do it, bread and water on Wednesdays and Fridays. She didn't say everybody had to fast on bread and water. She said the best thing to fast from is sin. Oh, it doesn't do much good to fast on bread and water if you're going to keep on being uncharitable or if you can eat your kids for lunch. <laughs> Our Lady is very practical. She's a mother, remember? Our Lady asks us to practice what we preach and to live lives of charity towards our neighbors. And our first neighbor is our family. The, the ones we live the closest to. And that's usually the hardest part. And the other thing she asks us for is prayer from the heart. In other words, a personal, vital, loving relationship with God on a very personal manner. Or in a very personal manner. So I try to live these. It's nothing new. These have been the practices of the church 
since the beginning of the Christian era. Maybe that's why it's so hard to do them, because they're so ordinary. And we all know that's what we're supposed to do. It's just that she comes as a mother to remind us. Anyway, this, this was my, my uh, little introduction from our lady, from her dear son, Demetri And on June 18th of that same year, as I was lying in my bed at night, my husband was down watching TV, the news. I had finished praying my rosary, the lights were out, it was very hot, I was thinking of nothing in particular. I suddenly heard a voice. And the voice was very beautiful. And the voice said, why don't you ask? I, there was nobody there. I, I was frightened for a minute. And my next thought was, well, what is it I'm supposed to ask for? And as I said those words, this prayer was given to me. Now, I don't mean it was dictated to me. I mean, I found myself praying it out loud without thinking of the words. They, they were there on my mouth, coming out of my mouth, and I was listening to myself pray these words that weren't coming from my mind. And this was the prayer. Dear Mary, my mother, Queen of Peace, whom I believe is appearing at Medjugorje, please ask your son to heal me in any way I need to be healed. I know your son has said that if you have faith and you say to the mountains move, that they will move. I believe. Please help me in belief. And as I finished the prayer, I felt this feeling from my feet all the way through my body, but particularly on my right side, which had the bone deformities and was more affected by the MS than the left side. And my last thoughts were, this can't be happening to me. This can't be happening to me. As this beautiful feeling went through my body, it was like effervescence, it was like sparkling, it was a marvelous feeling. And I remembered nothing. I woke the next morning, I was late to my scripture class at the local university. My husband had to hurry up, get my wheelchair in the car, and get me in the car to send me off. And when I got there, I had to lay out on the horn to get somebody from the uh, cafeteria kitchen to take me out because I, the people, my, my uh, student helper, Laverne, had already gone into class because I was late because I'd overslept. I remember nothing about the night before. I was not healed. One of the sister, sister cook came out of the kitchen and got my wheelchair out of the back of my specially equipped car and helped me into it and wheeled me into my class. And in the middle of the class, at break time, I went through the motion to my student helper Laverne to help me into the restroom because I wore depends that day and depends are not very dependable. I also had no back bladder control whatsoever. And as I did, I felt this searing heat from my feet all the way up through my whole body. It was extremely uncomfortable, and I thought, what is this? And the next thing that happened was I felt the, uh, like, pins and needles all over my body. And it was followed by an incredible feeling because by the end of that class, I could feel the wrinkles inside my shoes. And during that class, the priest was telling the class, unknown to me because I had turned him off because I was, this was all happening to me and I was remembering what the doctor said, that there was no remission, that this was progressive, that the damage, the bone damage and the muscle damage and, and all the damage I had was irreversible, that it was permanent, even if I went into remission, whatever, it would never get better. And the priest was telling everyone there were no such things as miracles. They could all be explained naturally. When Jesus walked on the water, he was walking on a sandbar. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he was getting the people to share their meals with one another, and so on. And I heard none of it. I went home. I know my time is up, so I'm going to have to make this fast. But I went home. I don't remember driving home. I went, I went to, to take, take my brace off because, because I knew something had happened. And as I went to take my right brace off and stared at my right leg, it was perfectly straight. And all the deformities, the bone deformities, were gone. I just remember screaming at the top of my lungs, my God, my God, my leg is straight, my leg is straight. My husband wasn't home. He and the girls had gone to the farm north of us to pick berries. It was the strawberry season. And they were up in the fields picking. I managed to get my other brace off. I was bare-legged. I stuck my blue skirt up in my waistband. And I grabbed my crutches, and bare-legged I began to walk through the hallway. 
And as I did, my legs were perfectly straight. And I was praising God all the way. I didn't walk as I did before on the palms of, or the soles of, my, the, of, of the front part of my foot and the balls of my feet with my legs swinging out because of the uh, uh, various deformities that I had, like the dropped ankles and the var- various deformities and so on. I was walking heel toe. And finally I got to the steps that lay, lead upstairs and I remember putting my hand on the balustrade and as I did, it must have been like the Lord saying, you know, I really, uh, you know, don't you realize what I've done for you? And in an instant I had a, 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 like a vision of my whole life from the time I was very small and had almost drowned and had the near-death experience up to and including the night before when I heard the beautiful voice say, why don't you ask the prayer that was given to me and the feeling I experienced and I knew I was totally healed. And I put my crutches by the side of the front door at the foot of the steps and I said, to God, if I'm healed, I can run up these steps. And I did, all the way, up to the second floor and then I lost it. I was a screaming idiot. I remember running down at the top of my lungs and throwing the door open and screaming, my God, my God, I'm healed, I'm healed. I can run, I can run, I can run. And I took off. And thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Blessed Mother. And I ran across our, our lawn. I ran down through our woods. I ran down through the creek, bare-legged. And finally, I found myself back up in the, in the, behind the house again, screaming and praising the Lord. And the only one who knew anything had happened was my dog. <laughs> and he was following me and barking. And I thought I have to tell somebody. So I went in the house and I was grabbing Kleenexes and blowing my nose and, and praising God and grabbing the phone and trying to dial my pastor, Father Berkman's number. And I finally got him on the phone and I was screaming to him, I'm healed, I'm healed, I don't have a mess anymore, I don't have a mess anymore. And he kept saying, who is this, who is this, who is this? <laughs> and finally I said, it's, he said, is this Rita? And I said, yes. And I said, I can run, I can run. I don't have a mess anymore, I can run. He kept saying, I heard you, I heard you. He said, is there anybody there with you? <laughs> and I said, no, just my dog. And he said, you sit down and you take some aspirin and you call your doctor okay and I hung up on him they didn't believe me so the next person I called was Marianne the one who took me to the healing mass and I couldn't even talk by the time I got her she thought something terrible had happened she rushed over to find me standing with my skirt up and my and my waistband and and twigs in my hair and my legs all splattered with dirt and, and praising God and she thought, what is this? You know? But in a moment, she realized there were no crutches, that my legs were straight, and I was completely restored. And we were both dancing. And she said, we have to go show Father, just Father. And I said, I tried to tell him he didn't believe me. He said, get in. She said, get in my car, we'll go. We've got to show Father. Where are the, where's Ron and where are the girls? And I said, they're up picking berries at Gardner's Farm. And she said, we'll, we'll go right up there. We'll find them. So on the way, we stopped at the rectory in Father's eyes. He kept saying, sit down, sit down, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt yourself. And I kept saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, just give me a blessing. I have to go find my husband and the girls. And so he did bless me, and I did leave. And his last words to me, call your doctor, take care of yourself, you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> anyway, we missed Ron and the girls, they'd already gone home, the picking had stopped for the day. And when I got home, they were already in the house. And of course, it found my crutches and my braces with nobody in them and didn't know what was going on. And Mary Ann said to me, you wait out here and I'll go in and prepare them so they don't, you know, your husband doesn't have a heart attack or something. So anyway, they came out and then it was like pandemonium. I was, I was dancing and I was singing and I'm Irish and I was doing the Irish jig. Don't ask me to do it now. And the girls were crying and they kept asking me what happened I kept saying Jesus healed me Jesus healed me through his holy mother I don't have a mess anymore and little Heidi my youngest was seven and she just looked at me and she says mommy don't act like this (laughs) mommies aren't supposed to act like this and I said honey you don't understand Jesus healed me through his holy mother I don't have a mess anymore remember and she said oh good now I don't have to do any more work Well, my time is up. But before I go, I want to say just a few words anyway. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your generous spirit. You made me feel so welcome. And I want you to join me in praising the Lord for all the good things that not only has he given me, but all the miracles in your lives, because you've all had them. Maybe not big and spectacular, Because remember, whomever the Lord gives much to, much is expected. 
And I ask you to pray for me and, and for, for my uh, ministry the Lord's given me, and I in turn will remember you in prayer. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him on high, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 